the audience who wishes to address us on any issue that's on the agenda at this time. Hearing none, we'll call the meeting to order officially and have a roll call of attendance, please. Done. Need a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 We need to approve the consent agenda. And on this consent agenda, we are accepting $3,300 in donations from our community groups uh, and members of our community. These funds, we are certainly grateful for them. We always use them for the needs of the students based on the wishes of the donor. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Tonight we have some presentations. Student staff meeting. Right. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm Jim Beaker, and I'm the assistant to the Community Learning, and also the Wildwood Principal this year. And we have been fortunate enough to have a STEM classroom at Wildwood this year, and also um, some of the things and other classrooms too are using this outdoor learning space. And um, we wanted to share this outdoor learning space with you and be able to show you that. So Julie Comfort is going to talk a little bit about that, and we have a couple guests here that we'd like to give awards up to. Hi, I'm Julie Comfort. I'm the STEM teacher at Wildwood. And we're so fortunate that this summer Luigi Vigiano uh, created an outdoor classroom for us. And all of the students at Wildwood, all 600 plus of them get to use it. So not only in STEM, but if they want a teacher wants to take them out to read a book, it's a nice quiet spot to read or just get out and enjoy nature. So we have a few pictures we want to show you. Um, there's Jeannie. Jeannie's been a big part of this. She's been kind of my sidekick, helping me come up with ideas. And um, on the left picture, you'll see um, she got woodchuck nursery, woodchuck tree service to donate some mulch for us so we could mulch the path up to the outdoor classroom and in the outdoor classroom. And there's some of the kids helping there. And there's Luigi in the outdoor classroom. And there it is in the, when it's all finished, <laughs> the <laughs> summer. And you can see some really cool um, little mushroom down there. If you look closely, the kids are really good at observing and seeing neat little things in nature. And there's some of the kids on the path. On the uh, right side, the two pictures, Jeannie collected some seeds from the O.H. Anderson wildflowers and brought them over and our kids were able to spread them out on our campus. So we'll have some wildflowers too. <coughs> Second graders adopt a tree for the year and they observe it throughout the year. You can see their little cushions they sit on and they observe and they find all sorts of cool things. There's the kindergartners in the fall on a little walk enjoying the leaves. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Just the kids up by their trees. They don't look very excited, do they? Look at that. <laughs> They're so excited when they go out there. <laughs> and then um, Jeannie also wrote a grant for us through the Greater White Bear Lake area is that how you say it? Foundation, community foundation for binoculars. And we got a set of these for the STEM classroom. So the kids, when they go outside, they can see the birds up high in the tree. And we do have sand cranes, so they get scared away easily. So I'm hoping this spring we'll be able to, from a distance, observe them. And so it's kind of cool. So, and that's the last one. Oh, one more. Yeah. <laughs> There's the kids loving their trees. <laughs> So we just wanted to thank them and give them certificates mm -hmm. and uh, really appreciate it. So okay, we're going up out here. Thank you so much. And then Luigi Viag.
a great motivator. <laughs> Thank you guys all. I really appreciate it. Superintendent Dufferin, Chair Schwartz, member of the board. Uh, I'm Aaron Forsyth, Activities Director at the high school. Here tonight to just give you some highlights from our fall athletic season and talk a little bit about uh, opportunities we have for growth um, to continue to be student-centered uh, through activities and athletics going forward. Um, we had a, a very good fall season. We had 434 student athletes out, which is over a third of our student body. Our tennis team was, again, uh, Metro East Conference champions. We had um, Annika Munson, seventh grader, win the singles 4A section tournament. She qualified for the state tournament. Uh, boys soccer, Metro East Conference champions and section 4A champions. They finished their season with a record of 15 and three, coached by Dominic Isaac. Football team, coached by Dave Metzel. Uh, district champions for the <coughs> second time in three years. They finished their regular season with a record of six and two. Girls Swim and Dive had a very productive uh, season. Um, they finished second in Section 4, and they were, they were also runner-up in the Metro East Conference, finished their Metro East Conference record uh, with 6-1. and one. They had three um, relay teams qualify for the state tournament, a 200 medley relay, 200 freestyle, and 400 freestyle relay. Uh, girls had a great experience, coached by Mike Goldman. And Girls Soccer, uh, Section 4 champions and back-to-back -back state champions um, they have our girls soccer programs coached by mr dave wald eight state titles which is a uh, state record for schools in minnesota so some highlights from our our fall season and something else i want to just take some time to to talk a little bit about just so you're aware and that's the state <coughs> high school's why we play initiative uh, and an overview of it, and just three, basically three main topics I just want you to be aware of. Uh, it's it's tra a transformational approach to education-based athletics. And when we talk about high school athletics, we're unique and different in that we're not the uh, club experience. It's a $15 billion business across the country. And that's not high school athletics. We're also not necessarily community ed. Uh, either there's a difference there and both of those have a, a great purpose it's just important for us to recognize that the state high school league experience is unique in that way uh, and part of that is the state high school league's why we play initiative and that's a focus on purpose-based athletics and making sure that we're student-centered um, and we're striving to give our kids the best experience possible so just three things I'd like to just highlight and that's transactional versus transformational and when you think of a transactional coach when, when I say that, uh, the picture in my head pops up is Bobby Knight. Uh, win at all costs, and we're gonna do anything we can to win. And it isn't always the best experience for our students or the most opportunity for them to grow as people. Transactional coaches see whatever sport they're coaching as a means or a way to build and develop character amongst their student athletes. And we strive to have a balance there. We also need to talk about and differentiate between goals and purpose. We all have goals. Every time we step onto a field or a court or a rink or a mat, we want to win. In fact, polling uh, just under 200 of our student athletes this fall, the number one goal our student athletes had was winning. They wanted to win. Um, but that doesn't define us or define them or who we are. 
as, as a school or as, as an institution. The purpose is why we're actually out there and, and pulling those same students. So the number one reason why our student athletes in the fall came out for whatever sport they participated in was to have fun. And the second most common reason was to be with their friends. So if we can be cognizant of that as we're coaching and help build character through sports, we're gonna have a better experience. And that brings me to the final topic I just wanna bring attention to, and that's performance and moral character traits. When I talk about performance, character, think, I think of a resume, things you'd want to be on your resume, like responsible, organized, diligent, hardworking, all very important things for us to develop in our, in our kids. And uh, when we talk about moral character, um, not to be too gloomy, but I think about a eulogy, something you'd want people to say about you. They were generous, they were kind, they were loyal. And we use those two things, performance and moral character traits, as our foundation of how we approach coaching. Uh, and the reason I bring this up today is why we play is provides a curriculum for us to give our coaches tools and the skill set to enhance our student athletes' experiences while they're participating in our programs at our school. So it's something hopefully you'll hear more about as we go forward. Um, and it's something I'm looking forward to. We have over 90 coaches at Mount Amita High School when you count our volunteer coaches, and all of them have a purpose statement right now tied to why we play. And it's something that we're gonna build on in the future and, and something hopefully um, I'm excited for you guys to hear about going forward. So, thank you. Yeah. Exhausted. <laughs> <laughs> Madam Chair, Superintendent, and Board Members, I'm Kathy Weiland, Matamidi Community Education Director, and I'm here tonight to provide an update on Matamidi Community Education. If I can do it. Um, the update is broken down into five parts, beginning with the annual report for the last school year, and will end with the collaborative collaborative initiative called the Many Faces of the White Bear Lake Area. The annual report is submitted and required by the Minnesota Department of Education and so we do it every year. Last year we served a little over 10,000 community members of all ages and that's about 500 more than we served the previous year. And that number would be higher if we included early childhood but they submit separate reports to MDE. One of our biggest jobs is working with work is scheduling and working with the many groups who use our district facilities. Last year we worked with 47 groups and we estimate that that brought in over 18,000 visitors to the district. The board heard the audit report at its last meeting and I would like to highlight information specific to the Community Education Fund or Fund 4. When we consider it with all district budgets, it's 4.1% or about $2 million. The community education fund balance is separate from the general fund balance. And last year, we reduced our fund balance by 11,000, but we still ended the year with a positive fund balance of over $600,000. Within the community ed fund balance is a separate fund balance for the preschool program called School Readiness. And that fund balance was 50,000 in the red last year. And we improved that this year by increasing fees for early childhood programs and getting a tighter handle on expenses. And we still ended the year in the red, but only by $5,000. So um, we'll be working to make sure that that trend continues. And finally, Community Ed supports the general fund by contributing a little over 18% of its budget to the district. 
and we do that through chargebacks and um, helping fund some staff positions. And one of my goals this year is to look into that a little deeper and then share my findings with the superintendent and then um, determine what further action will be taken. On facility improvements at the October school board meeting, I mentioned community ed's involvement in a variety of facility improvements. And since that meeting, we've added the passenger railings to the community ed bus. We built a carport or shelter for the bus and two district vans, and that will give them some protection from the elements. We ordered a gaga ball pit for OH Anderson. It'll be on the outdoor playground. We're, up, we're pretty pumped about that. And we'll be refurbishing the shed by the football stadium and looking at making some improvements at Wildwood's outdoor playground and the fields here at the district center. We're in the news. Um, we send photos regularly to the White Bear Press. And we were fortunate to have suburban community cable TV tape several events this fall, including the most recent one, which was a Many Faces of the White Bear area. And speaking of that, um, it's an initiative focused on equity and honoring our past, the pre understanding the present, and planning for the future. It's a collaborative effort with several partners, including White Bear Area Schools, the White Bear Area Historical Society, the Greater White Bear Foundation, and others. And Kevin's an active member of our steering committee. The first installment was Original People, Dakota and Ojibwe, and it was a success with 79 attendees at Matamidai's event and that included Kevin and Julie and Barb, and then White Bear had 101 at their event. The next installment is on changing traditions in the 1850 to 1950 time period, and the last is on shifting demographics with the baby boomers and migration. Information on these installments and some associated events we're really excited about, specifically February 21st with Jim Lane, our high school life science teacher, and March 20th with, with Duchess Harris, who is a district parent, and author are listed on this flyer, which each of you should have at your place. And now, I'm happy to entertain any questions you may have. Okay, where's the Duchess Harris one on here? It's on the back page oh, the at back. the bottom, okay. Hidden Human Computers. Her grandma was one of the first black women recruited to work at NASA. And, she, and her book wasn't, they didn't use her book for the movie, but it's a similar story. Okay. And she was named after her, too. I, I would add on the Duchess Harris piece, if there's one thing you do, well, Jim Lane is really good, too. Okay, if there's two things you do, <laughs> it's the Jim Lane tree cookie discussion, but the Duchess Harris, uh, she's just an amazing, amazing woman, and uh, it would, I wouldn't miss that. And the, uh, the Matamida event was in the White Bear Press this week, B section, but still in there, so. It was very enjoyable. It was really a lot of good information. Thank you for all your work on that. Thank you. Anybody else? Thanks, Gabby. Luke. All right, my turn. Mm -hmm. All right. So. Uh, last week we ended off with a bit of a cliffhanger. Wanted to see how the uh, <laughs> girls' women dive team did at state. They did not place, but uh, according to Francis Fritch, a member of the Matamidi girls' women dive team who sits next to me in Spanish class, it was quote uh, still fun. So I'd call that a win. Uh, let's move on to Wildwood. In November, on the 16th, the Como Zoo visited uh, kindergarten classrooms and shared uh, I, what I would assume to be different animals. So kindergartners got to learn about different animals, the animal kingdom. Uh, on the 19th, second graders watched a puppet show put on by Pacer, which is a center that raises awareness for school children with uh, disabilities. And on the 20th of November, there was an all-school pajama day, which <laughs> I can assume must have been a blast. <laughs> uh, on December 4th, Wildwood and OHA had their Hour of Code in which students got to practice and learn about the art of coding. And on the 7th, Kindergarten had their Family and Friends Day. Uh, moving on to OHA, on November 20th, there was Turkey Bingo. This was actually live streamed through YouTube, and we had Mrs. Bowers, the principal, and Mrs. McCabe, the school counselor, calling the bingo board. Mrs. Bowers was wearing a turkey leg handband 
headband, and Mrs. McCabe was in full turkey costume. It was a sight to see and a blast for the whole school. Uh, in December, and this is actually happening tomorrow, so I'm kind of cheating here, but here we are. Uh, on the 14th, tomorrow, there's a Saints North roller skating party from 5.15 to 7.15 for OHA and Wildwood students. And on the 14th, there is a History Comes to Life third grade in-house field trip. Uh, moving on to the middle school. All right, I think this is pretty cool. From December 3rd to December 13th, there were one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different concerts. There is a sixth, seventh, and eighth grade concert uh, for band, and then a sixth, seventh, and eighth grade concert for choir, along with a Glee Cub concert. So uh, I'm sure those must have been a blast. Finally, moving on to the high school, winter sports are in full swing. Boys and girls basketball, alpine, and cross country skiing, archery, gymnastics, wrestling, and boys and girls hockey are all occurring uh, now and are in the height of their season. Uh, on November 20th, uh, there was a janitorial and lunch staff appreciation day where students uh, would help uh, the lunch staff and janitorial staff clean up after lunch and make a better effort to help to keep the school a cleaner place. And uh, I can say from my own experience, the school is now continuing to be a, a cleaner place. So I think there were some serious benefits that came off out of that. Uh, on November 26th, there was a fall jazz concert, and on the 27th, there was a symphonic band concert. And now upcoming, this Saturday, SLC, or the Student Leadership Council, is hosting a parents' night out from 5 o'clock to 9.30, at which I will be working. So if you own uh, or know any children ages infant to fifth grade, <laughs> um, drop them off over at the high school, <laughs> and we'll take great care of them. It'll be a blast. Uh, and finally, on December 17th, this next Monday, there is a winter choir concert at 7.30. Um, that's my spiel. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. I think we should save you for the end in the future. You know, like the grand finale. Yeah. I think people yes. would stay the entire time. Moox you know, courts are just like that. Oh, they? They're really bad. They're really bad. Thank you very much. Yes, Thanks. Uh, we need a motion to approve the minutes of our last meeting, November 15. So moved. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 We do have some discussion items, calendar of events. Anyone want to call anything out on it? I'd like to add something that's not on the calendar. The Wildwood Artist Series on December 21st is doing a sing-along with Ross Sutter at Wildwood Elementary. They'll sing with kindergartners or with first graders at 9:35, kindergartners at 2 o'clock, and second graders at 2:45. And all the board is invited to come sing along with the elementary students. Mm -hmm. What day is that again? Uh, 21st, next Friday, a week from Friday. Well, Your time, yep, yeah, before the break. Your time choices are 9:35 to 10:05. 2 to 2.30 and 2.45 to 3.15. The Wildwood Artist Series um, donated the money to have Ross Setter come in and sing with the kids. So I will be at one of those and I hope the others can join at some point as well. And we do have to sing? You have to sing. Uh-oh. Uh -oh. We'll give you a mic even, <laughs> Kevin. <laughs> that might limit the participation. <laughs> <laughs> Budget. Bill. Good evening, some wonderful presentations tonight from Mr. Forsyth and Dr. Weiland and now Luke, and, uh, and I have a spreadsheet, so, uh, <laughs> so buckle up. <laughs> uh, on the screen and at your place tonight, you'll find the 2018-19 revised budget for discussion. Uh, we will seek formal approval from the school board at our next meeting, which is on January 10th. So tonight, uh, discussion and, and action, next meeting on January 10th. So just. Uh, by way of orientation on the spreadsheet, and I do realize it's a little bit difficult to view on the screen, so I'll try to follow back and forth as much as I can. Um, <clears throat> but just by way of orientation, you have uh, revenues and then expenditures by object code. 
and then expenditures by program dimension and I'll go over what those are and then at the bottom just to provide a little bit of color uh, uses of funds expenditures by object dimension so things like salaries benefits purchase services supplies and materials and then uses of funds obviously the same funds but broken out by program dimension so things like regular and elementary uh, education special ed vocational instruction things of that nature and then reading from left to right 2017-18 actual amounts so that's audited amounts as of last year and the end of 2017-18 uh, on June 30th the 2018-19 preliminary budget which was approved by the board back in June 2018 before the start of the fiscal year is required by statute and then the 2018-19 revised budget uh, what you see in front of you uh, tonight and what we will be rec uh, recommending at the next meeting on January 10th and then the increase or decrease is just simply from the preliminary budget to the revised budget or vice versa okay so overall uh, comment we're in a difficult position right now because we are forecasting less on the revenue side lower revenue on the revenue side and higher expenditures on the expenditure side and so I'll get into some of the details of why the movement from the preliminary budget and then certainly take any questions that you may have as it is a discussion item tonight so looking first at the revenue side uh, the revenue in the general and this is all general fund so the revenue in the general fund we're projecting to be down by about 127,000 from uh, pre preliminary budget to revised budget so 127,000 or about 0.3 percent okay so that's uh, attributed to two main areas state and federal aid okay so you can see that our federal aid we're forecasting to be down about 124,000 and that's largely related to our federal special ed special, federal special ed allocation we've seen a decrease there and that's the cause for the de de decrease in federal revenue and the other is state aid so a little bit misleading here you can see the large balances here that state aid which as you remember is is largely paid to us as in the form of the state aid funding formula as appropriated by the legislature so a little bit misleading because you see actually just a slight decrease here of 23,000 however uh, there are uh, a number of line items that roll into this state aid summary so things like long-term facilities maintenance aid operating capital aid uh, and then finally the state aid funding formula so uh, as you'll remember uh, state aid is driven by enrollment and our enrollment target for the preliminary budget was 3,288 students um, we are currently at 3,283 students in that right in that neighborhood so we're down five from target and in order to be conservative I'm recommending that we build the revised budget on 3,270 students which would be down 18 from uh, the preliminary budget so that's uh, the main cause for the decrease there is a conservative estimate based off of student count and uh, not knowing where student count is going to go in the second semester that's that's what uh, I'm included for a discussion moving on into the expenditure side um, again looking at expenditures by object dimension so this is what I'm going to spend the majority of time on because it's a little bit easier to get through uh, so things like salaries benefits purchase services supplies and materials capital and miscellaneous or the same broken out by administration district support services regular so elementary and regular secondary instruction vocational instruction special ed instructional support services pupil support services sites and buildings and fiscal and other and one thing I would like to point out uh, the information that we presented as part of the levy campaign really does hold true if you look at the graphs down below so uh, salaries and benefits um, as a percentage of our uh, of our total is 77 percent of our budget so we always talked about school districts being people intensive organizations and so that, that certainly does hold true in this column right so the blue plus the orange that's 77 percent of our of our expenditure budget in the general fund and then looking over here in terms of where we're focusing our dollars uh, regular elementary and secondary regular instruction plus vocational instruction plus our special education instruction accounts for 70 percent of our expenditure budget on the program side right so as has historically been the case and continues to be the case our district is doing a nice job of focusing our expenditures on the education experience for our kids now going back up to uh, the expenditure side and looking at the difference between preliminary and um, and final budget 
Uh, our, our revised budget shows an increase on the expenditure side of uh, $653,000 or 1.6% change from the preliminary budget. Okay? And uh, the increase in expenditures from the revised or from the preliminary to the revised can be attributed to salaries and benefits, purchase services, and capital expenditures. And I'll just go over those uh, quickly here. So first starting with salary and benefits, so we're talking about things like contractual obligations. Um, contract settlements reaching back in some cases all the way back to the beginning of the 2017-18 year that we've settled here in 2018-19. Well, the retro pay for that instead of being paid in 17-18, all of that is going to come through in 18-19. Um, staffing additions related to hotspots, specifically or referencing like first grade, for example, when we added that section of first grade based on based on our student enrollment. So. Uh, Overall, it is important to note that we have decreased our licensed FTE numbers related to the reductions that were approved by the school board last year from 220, right in the neighborhood of 220 in 1718 to 213 in 1819. So a reduction of about seven FTE year over year, unfortunately related to the budget reductions that uh, we recommended to the board last year. So uh, what you see here is net of those reductions. Looking at purchase services, so that's an area that is up uh, about 375,000 uh, from preliminary budget. The increase here relates to PSEO, which is post-secondary enrollment options. So we're continuing to see that program grow and our budget was just not sufficient for what we expect to receive in invoices related to that, specifically uh, Century College PSEO. That's also related to TIES, which TIES is our um, software program and the dissolution of ties. Um, so we have some fees related to that, that we have been assessed as a member district, as all member districts have been assessed. So uh, an increase is partially related to that. And then finally, transportation costs, specifically in the special ed and homeless transportation. So we've seen an increase in our special ed and, uh, and, and a slight increase in our homeless transportation. And so it's a, that's a little bit cumbersome because um, when you increase your special ed transportation, the revenue, there's a corresponding increase in revenue. However, that revenue is paid in the year following, right? So we would expect, based on this estimate, to see an increase in our special ed revenue in 1920. So the budget is a little bit cumbersome. We expect to see that revenue next year, but we do have the expenditure this year. And then finally, uh, in the capital item, so you can see that that's up about 125000 this is a planned spend down of the capital projects levy, the technology levy for a data warehouse. And let me just take a second to explain that because if it sounds cumbersome, it is. Um, our capital projects levy, also known as our tech levy, provides a lot of our wireless data warehouse, also a lot of the technology for tool, the tools for teachers in their classrooms, right? So uh, we have been slowly building up that restricted fund balance for the capital projects levy, such that we ended last year with about $150,000 in the bank restricted for the capital projects levy fund, okay? We're gonna, we would like to use half of that, and this is in conjunction with the discussions with Patrick, we would like to use half of that to replace the data warehouse this year, right? And so although it looks like we've increased the budget, it's a planned spend down of about half of that fund balance. So it still shows as an expense, the source of the funding coming from the capital projects levy fund balance. So overall, um, that's, that's the overall change from the uh, preliminary to the revised budget. Just a couple things on decision making and recommendations. So uh, we'll touch on this in the truth and taxation presentation as well. Uh, we know that the operating levy dollars, as we have discussed before, will help. Uh, we will receive those dollars in 2019-20. In and forward, but as we've also discussed, it will not solve all of our financial um, issues that we have going. So uh, where we're at now is, is we need to find a way, and, and we will start at the board level in February, find a way to stop the, um, the decrease of our fund balance in the general fund, because we're getting to a place where we can't, we can't see it go too much lower. So we'll start uh, that process again at the board level in February. Uh, and then just some short-term changes uh, that we will make here. So uh, we're going to hold off on some of our staff development um, expenditures. 
Now that will help uh, to the tune of about $20,000, I believe. So not a huge number there, but that's something that we can do in the short term. And then we will continue to look at that PSEO uh, further in the history on that and why we're seeing some of that increase. So um, just in terms of next steps, as I mentioned, just review as a discussion item tonight, uh, give you some time to think about this, ask questions if you need to, and then seek uh, approval at the next meeting on January 10th. We, uh, I, I heard, I don't know if it was sometime last year, and I, again, I forget where I heard this, but this idea of negotiating with Century College on the PSEO tuition costs, I, I thought there was something mentioned, I don't know if anybody else remembers this, but this idea of having them, for lack of a better uh, term, you know, give us a little better deal. Um, with our relationship with Century College. I, again, I'm sorry I can't be more clear. I just remember there was a, uh, some discussion on that. And I know Century College isn't sweating in money either, um, but if there was a way that we, if they were open to something like that, I, it seems to me that there's some school districts that are doing that with Normandale possibly now. So I don't know if that gives you enough to go by, but. Um, I can certainly look into it and call up there and talk to them about okay. it. Yeah, thank you. Um, so you mentioned the, the budget was based on 3288, then it went down to 3283, and now and you're gonna revise it for 3270? No, and that's just because you might have more attrition? Is that, I mean? Yeah. I've, I've I guess I think I'd like to build a little bit of a buffer in there. Typically, school districts will lose students in the second semester. Now, historically, Montemedi has not at the level that a lot of districts have. Um, what I would like to happen is we stay right where we are okay. uh, and that, that um, the 13 or 15 students that I have above what we've built the revised budget on provides us with a little bit of a shot in the arm at the end of the year. Okay. 3270 number is for next year. That's um, so the revised budget column. Right. I built that on an estimate of 3,270 students. Right. Yep, yep. So, uh, I another reason I I, I don't want to get below that number, right? So I want to come up with a number that I'm confident that we will finish the year. have an action item or two tonight um, <coughs> Julie good evening superintendent board members I'm Julie Osterbauer supervisor of buildings and grounds and I'm asking for approval to award atomic sheet metal the low bidder for the exterior insulation finishing system project. This project will be funded from the long-term facility maintenance budget. And a little bit of history with this, this is kind of the stucco looking stuff on the high school and the middle school, uh, installed in 1989, 1996, and 2003, and it's in the advanced stages of degradation and at the end of its lifespan. And on August 23rd, the facility committee, along with Jeff Jones from CISO, Troy Thompson from Garland Companies, uh, showed photos of the degradation and options for repairs. And we will be covering the EFITS with steel clad wall panels. Any questions? Oh. <laughs> She's my sidekick for the night. <laughs> Thank you. And this will show you on the right there, uh, line, so I'm sorry. <laughs> line item one is the <clears throat> second story of the high school. Um, that's where, I, I don't know, you've seen where the lacrosse balls have been thrown and the EFIS is cracked. Uh, line item two is the Chautauqua 
and then over into on top of the media center there is a penthouse and then light item three is the top of the middle school the penthouse is on top of the middle school so any questions Correct? Correct. Is there a motion, please? So moved. Second. Any additional discussions? All those in favor say aye. 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 All right. Thank you, and thank you, Dr. Wyland. Um, earlier this evening, I had the community meeting to present the world's best workforce information goals, and uh, you review the past goals and then how um, the progress is for that the, for the past 2017-18 uh, goals, and then what the progress was. And we did submit that progress report to the state this past week. And then now um, this evening, I'd like to ask the board to approve our future goals for the. 1819 school year so as we go through those so I won't go into it as much detail tonight or at this meeting because we spent an hour before to go through that so um, with the world's best workforce it is a state um, state legislation that has uh, five different areas and one of them is school readiness and under the school readiness goal this year we would like to look at increasing from 37 percent of our three and four year olds um, being able to be screened by their fourth uh, birth date to 40 percent. They're going to do a few things like advertising, um, trying to get the parents more engaged in the program in order to uh, bring a few more families in. The uh, reading by third grade goal, um, this year we want to set it for the MCAs to be in increasing from 64.5 to 67.5 and uh, the ways some of the strategies that we're going to be using with that is focusing a little bit more on the phonics and phoneme awareness in the small group instruction within the K1, 2, and 3 and continue with the balanced literacy and really enhance those small groups. The closing the achievement gap goal, we focused on the math in this area when they uh, students through third through eighth grade and in eleventh grade take the math MCA we would like to decrease um, that from 26.7 to 23.7 of the students that are in the free and reduced lunch to actually decrease that gap between um, all of the other students in our in our district taking that uh, taking that assessment and some of the ways that we're doing that for some of the strategies as you remember last year we went through the review where we talked about best practices so they're going to be implementing a lot of those best practices with math talks complex math instruction um, throughout throughout the district so. and then we have the graduation rate goal which we'd like to see um, students who graduate in seven years will increase from 98.25 in uh, 2017 to 100% um, in the 2019. And looking at that through uh, the middle school and the high school, they've put in some different uh, programs. One was the uh, Zephyr, not the Zephyr Hour, but the Zephyr Pride. I'm just trying to think of the overall name. I think it was the Zephyr, Zephyr Pride Program. Zephyr Success. Zephyr Success, yes. that's right, where they have Zephyr Pride, Zephyr Hour. They have different um, focus, uh, targeted, um, I guess, academic interventions to help the students. They also have their connecting. They might have a coach that actually meets students three, four times so that they feel more engaged within the schools. Then for the career and college readiness goal, we have the 11th graders who would like to meet all three Century College benchmark scores, the reading, math, and science, and the ACT will increase from 65.02 to 6802. And that um, we'll be working on different strategies with some of the reading supports in the uh, middle school and high school to help increase that goal. So if you have any any questions on some of those goals, otherwise at this time I would like to ask the board to uh, approve our world's best workforce goals. 
Okay. So moved. Oh, Second. Additional discussion? I, just, I had a question. Um, I, I, I just, one thing really stood out to me. The 37% of students screened. Isn't that low? It seems so low. It surprised me. For the yeah. ones. Uh, yeah. I, don't, I mean, I don't know. I'd have to look at in comparison to what other districts have. I'm not, I'm not sure. Okay. I talk to Stephanie about that. Just to okay. Yeah, okay. Thirty seven percent of current four year olds. Is that correct? Three. So three. Three and three, three, four, three between the ages four, of yeah, three, three and four. So because parents have to tell you they're in the district because they haven't they haven't signed up here yet, mm -hmm. how do you know that it's thirty percent of all the three year olds in the district? Or thirty seven percent. In the comparison, I'm sure they're using what they when the kids come to kindergarten okay. and going back to see, you know, how many actually showed up so it, it's based on our demographic we do we do keep track of that's so the de and through community education they have the demographics sure. report but um and one of the so the point of this goal is to screen students or children early yes. so that's why i don't know that that actually is low to screen between third and fourth three three, 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 three and four year olds so um I, but the idea is to get them early, and so you wouldn't necessarily expect to have have that. And then is that tied with ECFE? If they do need follow-up services? Right. The, it, at the preschool programming, then they would have special education services if they needed some additional support. So that's the reason they want to try to catch them between three and four, so that they'd have that year before kindergarten to work with them. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure as it get closer to, like, being five, that's when we try to get the 100% of them screened sure. by that time. So then they're probably reaching out to the families and contacting them. I know even this past summer at Wildwood, there was a few kids that were starting kindergarten that were coming in for the screening like a week or two before school. But see, we'd like to try to get them in earlier because if there was anything that we could really support and help their child with at that time, we would know and we could help them out. So that's why they, that's why they set that goal. Mm -hmm. I was struck by that fact also that it seemed low. As a, as a parent, I would think that would be something you'd want to do. So, I, I, you know, point of curiosity, I mean, if there was some readily available data that said, are we high, low, middle? I mean, it, it'd be interesting anyway. Right. I can ask uh, Stephanie a little bit about that to see if other districts you know what their percentage is because I know um, there's a few school districts that set that as one of their goals for the world's best workforce so I'm sure there would be some comparable I know um, we, we have data. Century College uh, students that come down and help in the screening which is kind of fun to see too. Mm -hmm. okay. Anything else? Mm -hmm. We have a motion and a second. All in favor of approving this please say aye. 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 I got one. Yep. Okay. Good evening and welcome. Um, I'm supposed to say that because there's supposed to be a sellout crowd here for the truth and taxation hearing. Um, and there might not be quite a sellout. Um, however, this is very prescribed and I'm going to give you the disclaimer ahead of time that although uh, there are some empty seats here for the viewing audience and for the board, uh, there are certain requirements of the truth and taxation hearing that I have to say in a certain order, in a certain way, I like to try to make finance presentations helpful and user-friendly. I hope that this will be helpful. I'm not confident that it will be overly user-friendly. I have to read a lot of this and, and get through it in a certain order and make sure that I say certain things. So welcome to the 2018-19 property tax hearing. Uh, the requirements of the tax hearing are really threefold and are important this year. Uh, they're important every year, but specifically this year related to the operating levy, the revoke and replace that was uh, uh, graciously approved by our taxpayers last month on November 6th. So the first requirement here is to look at the 18 pay 19 proposed property tax levy, the change and specific reasons for that change. Second, talk about the current year budget. 
uh, distribution of revenues by source and spending by program and then have a time for public comment and questions so uh, just before we turn the page here so you've heard me say this before when I when I reference 2018 pay 19 what exactly does that mean All right so in September you'll recall uh, certifying the preliminary 18 pay 19 levy okay uh, taxpayers received their property tax, their estimated property tax statements in the month of November, last month. And tonight we're recommending uh, that the board would certify the final levy for 18 pay 19. So what's changed since September, all right? So we obviously had a revoke and replace on the November ballot that was successful. Um, and so where this will go from here is 2018 is the data year. 2019 calendar 2019 is the year that uh, uh, this tax is payable for our taxpayers and then finally in 1920 is the district revenue so it really spans three years uh, but that's the explanation on why I keep referring to 18 pay 19 so first starting with levy information um, in total so you can see that we have uh, four different funds on the board here the general fund community education fund general debt service fund and OPEB debt service fund okay and I have included three columns this year which is really exciting actually there's four columns there but three that I'll reference um, and uh, the reason why there are three columns has to do with the November vote okay so the middle column the prelim 18 pay 19 and you're gonna see this repeat itself as we go over and look at these funds but the 18 pay 19 preliminary column that is the amount that the school board um, approved in a, on the prelim basis in September. Okay, so that's the amount. Obviously, the actual levy is from last year, and then the proposed 18 pay 19 is the amount that we are recommending for certification tonight, and that does include the increase from the November vote. Okay, so you can see that overall, uh, the total increase all funds is 7.99%. Okay, and so for the viewing audience, I'll review what each fund is. So the general fund, obviously our largest fund, and, and really is the fund for the day-to-day -day operations of the school district. And so as you'll recall, back in November, the revoke and replace had to do with our general fund operating levy. And so obviously that is the biggest amount of the, uh, the increase uh, is in the general fund. The community ed fund, community programs for early learning to adult enrichment, Dr. Weiland referenced that uh, tonight and that has a $33,000 increase year over year. The debt service fund, that's princi principal and interest on our uh, debt service bonds, so largely the new Wildwood School, but there are some others in there as well. And then finally, OPEB debt service. So OPEB stands for Other Post-Employment Benefits, and when we get to that slide, just so I have something to talk about on that slide, um, I'll, I'll save some of that for, for exactly what that is. But that's principal and interest on our voter approved uh, debt service bonds and it is important to note that this bottom one here does expire in 2022 so we're already getting towards the end of that so that that will be a, a good thing when we see that uh, paid off starting first with the general uh, levy comparison and I won't go over every detail uh, but you can see that at the bottom uh, the overall increase is one million twenty two dollars four hundred one million twenty two thousand four hundred fifty eight dollars right so that's comparing the proposed 18 pay 19 to the actual from last year okay so as you would expect to see from the November vote you'll recall uh, based on our adjusted pupil units and increasing our voter approved authority uh, we expected about a million dollars in additional revenue in the first tier I'm sure you remember that conversation and you could see that top line there referendum levies the compare in comparison to last year it's just over a million, right? One million, one hundred and seven dollars. So that really is uh, the increase from uh, from the November vote. Uh, just looking at a, a couple of other ones. So our capital projects referendum, also known as our technology levy that we talked about earlier, that we're going to fund that data warehouse out of, uh, that increased forty thousand uh, dollars. The capital projects levy is tied to what's known as the net tax capacity, uh, and that is. Um, the value of, of, of most of the value of our um, market value in our taxing district um, that net tax capacity year over year went up 6.3 percent okay so that's a that's good news for our taxpayers and good news for market values in our community so if the net tax capacity goes up capital projects referendum revenue goes up 
and the inverse is also true. So NTC went up 6.3% and the increase there is commensurate with that. Um, the equity levy is one that I would like to, to look at. So the equity levy has an inverse relationship with the referendum levy. So you can see that because our referendum levy went up, equity levy looks at our levy dollars in comparison to some of our uh, area districts and there is always going to be an inverse relationship and those slight decrease in equity revenue has to do with uh, with the increase in our referendum levy and then finally our long-term facilities maintenance revenue down here at the bottom you'll recall that was a three-year statutory increase and the increase of 27,000 relates to the third of three years um, statutory increase in LTFM revenue so in all likelihood that will level off and continue to be pretty steady here going forward so in total uh, the general fund increase year over year, year, over year is recommended at 12.27%. Uh, the community education levy, I'll go through some of these a little bit faster. So as I mentioned, programs in the community education levy include obviously community education, early childhood, school readiness, adult basic education. My fear is I'm forgetting some, but I don't know if Kathy's paying that close attention. Um, <laughs> and so, uh, the, the main change here in the $33,000 increase has to do with a positive adjustment in school age care levy. Okay, so what you see here is not only the current year levy, but also prior year adjustments. Okay, so we had a prior year adjustment to the good in school age care, and that's really the cause for the $32,000 increase in the community education levy. Looking at the debt service levy, uh, the increase is very small here, 0.68% year over year, and really the only increase here has to do with long-term facilities maintenance, which again is the same as in the general fund. Uh, a portion of your LTFM levy revenue is paid in the general fund, also paid in the debt service fund. The three-year statutory increase has to do with, uh, with the increase that we're seeing here in the debt service fund as well. And then finally, the OPEB uh, debt service comparison. OPEB again standing for other post-employment benefits. This is an account to pay for contractual obligations for certain employees who meet criteria, or criteria in their employment contracts, right? So no change year over year, very small $1,600. Uh, as I mentioned, expires in 2022. So we are nearing the end of the OPEB debt service levy. Now just looking at a visual representation of the levies in total, 17 pay 18. Uh, 18 pay 19 so you can see that in the blue that is the 2019 levy in the yellow uh, yellow I think we'll call that both monomedi colors that's the 2018 levy uh, you can see that the increase as we mentioned before related to the revoke and replace is in the general fund the other funds are relatively flat uh, the total increase year over year general community service debt service and OPEB debt service is 1,088,000 Going now to uh, the second part of the presentation, current year budget information. So this is always a difficult one with timeline because I just talked about the 1819 revised budget, okay? We're required here to talk about the preliminary budget, which was approved by the board in June, right? So uh, tying these budgets back and forth between what I talked about a couple of agenda items ago and this is gonna be difficult. What I'm required to do here is show the preliminary budget that was approved in June. So looking at the composite budget, so you can see the general fund uh, is by far and away the largest fund that we have, accounts for 82% of the total, right? So on the revenue side, 39.5 million of a $48.2 million uh, revenue budget can be attributed to the general fund. As we know on the revenue side in the general fund, state aid is the largest source of our revenue as appropriated by the legislature each biennium. Uh, 2019 will be a funding year and so the legislature as we know will be uh, meeting to discuss the funding formula for the, the next two years 73% uh, of our revenue budget comes to us from the state and then 21% from the local uh, levy both voter and non voter approved local levy amounts okay so uh, also as we've talked about on the expenditure side by way of not going through every line item but just making some general comments obviously public education uh, is a people intensive um, organization right school districts are people intensive organizations close to 80 percent if you add up our salaries and benefits uh, of our budget is attributed to salary and benefits right school districts are heavily 
people organization and the remaining 20 percent if we look down the line here is relatively fixed so uh, overall as we know uh, a large percentage of the funding on the revenue side is tied to student count right that's critically important um, and it's also important for the viewing audience uh, to know that um, administration and the school board uh, is doing what they can on the revenue side with the amounts that we can control right so of in the general fund anyway of that 39.5 million uh, the state and the state legislature determines the funding formula uh, for the vast majority of that right if you look at the amount that we actually have local control on that amount is very very small uh, but critically important that it's managed appropriately okay looking at some visual representations here uh, first revenue by fund uh, this is just a review of the previous slide so 82 percent of our uh, revenue budget is in the general fund 3 percent in food service 4.4 in the community ed fund and then 10 percent in the debt service fund and 0.7 in the OPEB debt service fund so uh, just a visual representation of our revenue by fund the next one is the the inverse and you would hope that this would follow sort of along the line and it does so almost uh, identical percentages here <coughs> excuse me um, break out by expenditure uh, by fund looking deeper at the general fund as it is the largest fund in our school district uh, largest piece of the pie looking at the expenditures by program area in a little bit more detail um, so just as a point of illustration here that I'd like to make that I did make earlier tonight if you look at uh, my mouse works here elementary and secondary regular instruction right that's 19.7 million and then special education instruction seven million twenty two thousand you add those two up that's about seventy percent of our total expenditures in those two program areas um, as I mentioned before I'll mention it again uh, this school district and the school board continues to do a great job of focusing expenditures on students and our educational experience for our kids uh, there are uh, percentages that are different than that and I think that's something we can take pride in is that we are focusing our expenditures where they should be focused um, looking at the other areas here administration and support services so that's obviously things like the school board uh, building and district administration our business area and then our teaching and learning department uh, regular instruction speaks for itself so does vocational special education instruction instructional support services right so 1.7 million in instructional support services that's things like our curriculum department um, our, our media our staff development a lot of that falls into the instructional support services pupil support services that's things like counseling health our transportation contract is a, a big chunk of that um, and then sites and buildings that's things like our custodial department operations and maintenance and then our operating capital and then fiscal and other that's uh, property and workers compensation insurance primarily uh, visual representation of the general fund expenditures by program uh, again just uh, showing uh, on a graph here what we reviewed on the last slide So getting towards the end here just a couple of, of summary slides so what are the main variables that cause property tax increases and decreases so um, this slide is intended to provide an understanding of what causes the change right so I mentioned at the beginning the overall increase year over year in our operating levy is 7.99 percent right so that's the increase in school district levy revenue right that's not necessarily the increase in everybody's property taxes year over year some people may have a negative change some people may have more than 7.99 percent these are the variables uh, summarized that that uh, will cause your change in market value all right so first one changes in market value uh, change in taxable market value from an assessment so um, if you add a deck onto your house if you finish a basement if you put an addition and you have an assessment that's going to change your market value and that's going to change your tax impact largely okay so changes in class rates or history so a change in valuation of other taxable properties uh, things like uh, seasonal properties agriculture commercial if those class rates change uh, your valuation could change obviously voter approved referendums for things that are for for uh, school districts cities counties so that will change your taxes and then state adjustments by the legislature and funding or a bonding session so those are sort of the four main reasons uh, why your taxes may change 
And then this last slide here, I, I realize it's pretty small, but, but interesting. Um, this is the overall referendum market value history in our taxing district. So all our parts of the nine communities that we serve over the last 15 years, right? So uh, referendum market value, that's the market value of all of our taxable property, excluding ag and seasonal, which we obviously don't have a, a ton of that here. So you can see that we are our RMV, a referendum market value, uh, again, which is different than the net tax capacity, but our RMV is up 3.14% year over year. So that's a nice change, right? That's good for our taxpayers and good for the properties in our district. And the overall change, uh, over, or the average change over the last 15 years is 2.48%. Okay, so um, this is a new high watermark for our district at 2,265,000,000. That's an awfully big number and as high as it has ever been. Um, and you can see that we have really recovered from the four or five years uh, from 08 to 2012, where we had negative uh, percentage changes in RMV. So that's a great thing to see for our taxing district. And then finally, looking at tax impact for uh, residential homestead. So uh, I mentioned the overall increase for the school district was 7.99%. So this slide is an attempt to take that and push it towards uh, tax impact for an estimated market value, right? So. I'll use the $350,000 market value because we're very familiar with that calculation. Um, if you have a home valued at $350,000, last year, your tax bill related to the school district, right? So this is voter, non-voter, all funds combined, would have been $1,951. Everybody sees that? Now, your $350,000 home would have increased if it was on average by the 3.14% change in value, right? So you go from 350 up to that 360,990, and your tax bill would increase from 1951 to 2124 rounded, right? So an increase of $172 year over year, which is an increase of 8.84%. Okay, so that's that's how you take the 7.99% and push it towards uh, your your market value change. Okay. So that's really uh, the overview. Uh, I know there was a time, I'll, I'll, I'll hand it back over to you, Board Chair Shorts. I know there was a time for public comment. I know we do have some administrators that are residents if they want to make comments. Um, comments or questions, anyone? Anyone on the board who are residents? And then we do need to certify the final, or the board does. So um, what I would like to do is hand this back over to you and, and have you take it from here on the final page, if you wanted to read that. That's this slide. That's what you have in front of you, yep. Um, this just outlines what those levies are. Whereas pursuant to Minnesota statutes, the School Board of Independent School District Number 832, Montemita, Minnesota, is authorized to make the following proposed tax levies for general purposes. The general fund, uh, $9,358,069.73. Community services, $306,907.97. Debt service, $4,726,602.30. The OPEB debt service, $322,477.31. And the total proposed tax levy, $14,714. No. Thousand dollars. <laughs> <laughs> there's too many. I'm sorry. There's too many numbers here. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the school board of Independent School District Number 832, Montemita, Minnesota, that the levy to be levied in 2018 for collection 2019 is set at fourteen million seven hundred fourteen thousand fifty-seven dollars and thirty-one cents. The clerk of the IST 832 School Board is authorized to certify the proposed levy to the County Auditor of Washington County, Minnesota. And we need a motion on that or anything? So moved. Second. Any additional discussion? Is there a typo here on the yes, bottom? It is. Yes. Okay. But she read it correctly. I read it correctly. Yes, I, I know that, but okay. All those in favor say aye. 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 832. I'm sorry. Okay. okay. Just saw it correctly.
Thank you for you all your work me. on this. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. You've been doing this a long time. You right? can't fool me. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thanks, Bill. Committee report. Does anybody have one? Well, um, I there was a meeting last uh, an AMSD board meeting last Friday, and Alice and Barb were there uh, along with me, and uh, they gave her some. Just we approved the legislative pat platform and updated position papers. Um, we had uh, the Chris Adamson and Lori Grivna, the government affairs consultants for AMSD, give short presentations on the upcoming legislative session and how we might be a good time now to approach our legislatures and uh, talk about, you know, reach out to them and maybe have coffee with them and and uh, how to how to kind of speak with them and. Um, and then New directors of a uh, director of communications there. He gave a little, little primer on social media for us, and so um, yeah, that's about it, really. Um, I really had their board meeting on Monday night, and really they just approved budgets and a few sponsorships. Um, Kevin, unless there was anything else you wanted me to share, I. That really, it was really a minimal meeting. All fund drive still happening. Even. All fund drive is still happening. Thank you to the board for participating. 100%. Yeah, that's okay. great. Good. Uh, MSBA. We have the delegate assembly. Julie was a delegate. We will be having new delegates next year. If people are interested, we talked about that earlier. Uh, Our sent out the um, list of what was approved um, by that delegate assembly. The next metro area coffee is tomorrow in Roseville, if you want to attend that. And then MSBA is moving more of their professional development to webinars. If you see those webinars come through and you can't make those webinars, if you sign up for them after the webinar, then you get a link to watch the recorded presentation. So don't be dissuaded by the timing of the webinar, because there was one this week, I think, at noon yesterday. And so, yes, if you're at work or eating lunch, <laughs> <laughs> that's not convenient for you if you do sign up then you get the link to the recording so consider that when you see those come through uh, can I piggyback on for MSBA? Sure. Um, so I wanted to just give a brief summary of the delegate assembly and if anyone wanted that um, that this was my third year in attending the assembly and there were more than a hundred delegates that came together on December 1st and these resolutions were brought forth by our peers across the state. There were 22 resolutions dealing with topics from education funding to school start times. Um, if anyone wants to see, um, I brought the whole book. <laughs> and in coming up with our legislative stuff, if there's any of these that you wanted to look at. But I did want to highlight um, one vote on resolution number two which I have not seen was a unanimous vote and listening to Bill's presentation tonight makes it appropriate um, be it resolved that MSBA urges the legislature to adopt one predictable and equitable special ed funding formula which eliminates the cap and returns transportation to a fully funded dedicated revenue source um, there was a lot of good discussion about that and um, a lot of discussion on calculating transportation for the current year instead of the past year <laughs> and all the uh, problem balancing the books when you allocate money based on last year <laughs> so anyway that was number two and it was unanimous so, so anyway just wanted to share that uh, 916 is in your packet any subcommittee reports the education Equity Alliance, EEA, had a meeting last week. Barb mm -hmm. uh, attended along with Mike Newbeck and uh, Courtney McCormick and Gretchen Bruner. Am I missing any other? Thanks, Lee. And then Amy Anderson, the parent. Yep, mm -hmm. Amy Anderson. So we had a nice showing from Montevideo. Again, the Education Equity Alliance is the partnership between North St. Paul, Maple Oak Dale, is a racially isolated district, and Montevideo. Uh, We've had this partnership going since EMED dissolved. I want to say it's been six, seven years now. But uh, um, 
the, the meeting was good. We have our, our two coordinators uh, from North St. Paul's, Lisa Tao and Courtney McCormick from Montemedi. And uh, part of the, the bringing the steering committee together is to try to uh, align our, our mission together. And I think, you know, there was, it, it has had some ups and downs. And uh, I think with the two women that are the coordinators, we are in really good hands. They're trying to assess just where we've been. I think there's just some trying to f untangle some of this. And then there was some nice discussion from the gentleman that was the principal from uh, uh, middle school in Maplewood. Elementary school. And his idea, which I really thought was a good one and echoed, was this idea of having students as a part of the steering committee. Mm -hmm. And we've had that in the past and, and haven't, uh, we didn't this time. So um, some good energy, and uh, I think we're, we are committed to this. Mm -hmm. And it benefits uh, both school districts. And it's really amazing the differences five miles make. In you know the difference between our schools and their schools and we hopefully we can uh, work get the best of all this both schools and bring them together and pollinate the other buildings so Barb did you have anything you want to add? No I'll just reiterate that I'm excited about the partnership and and recommitting to our mission um, I think I think the leadership right now um, is really gonna move us forward so yeah. they they have some good energy around the work so I'm excited mm -hmm. for it. Any other community reports? Uh, just wanted to point out that the annual Tree of Light was held last Friday, and that was sponsored by the Matamidai Area Food Shelves um, uh, that supports the families through the holidays. Um, presenters included the Matamidai Teacher of the Year, um, Mrs. Newman, and the event raised over $12,000, which was a new record. Also want to point out that the community lunch had a record high of 98 members, and I know Julie and Kevin and uh, Superintendent Dufferin was there, so um, that was great. And then also the Winter Spring Community Ed brochure is at the printer, and online registration will begin December 20th. So we will see all the fun activities that we get to choose from uh, very soon. dollars it's the best deal out there <laughs> food comes from aroma and we have our passages program students uh, help wait tables and uh, then there's usually some kind of a musical ensemble in this case it was the uh, silver harmony singers and it's just a great thing so if you're not at work and can stop by for the lunch we have the monthly now through April well, we'll have April, no, March, April, May. okay Real quick, PTO met this morning, and uh, I gave him a little bit of an update on what we're doing. Barb uh, helped me with the update, talking about the strategic planning that we're going to be doing, and uh, Alice gave a nice presentation on what sh what her job here is in the district, and um, really up in the ante on how we're communicating with everybody. And Tony uh, Pierce? Pierce, and Tony Pierce uh, gave a things they're going to be working on in concert with Alice and so um, they got a lot of information this morning which is really great so just a little update great. so I had one more date that I just wanted to mention I'm not sure if Lucy had this in her notes but the <coughs> the day at the Capitol oh, on March 25th MSBA date at the Capitol so mm -hmm. I want to just put that on your calendar anybody else Okay, um, I will uh, piggyback on um, on what Mike was talking about with the PTO Parent Connect today. We did get a chance to talk a little bit about strategic planning, um, and so I'll just put it out there that uh, we'll be looking for um, community members to join us in our strategic planning process, and so um, people should start looking for that it's coming out in maybe January, February, the call for, for some people to join us. Um, so there'll be lots of opportunity for lots of involvement. I, I did want to just highlight a few places I'd been in, uh, around the district, um, including the Matamidai Hour of Code on December 4th, mm -hmm. 
which was um, it was amazing. Uh, and if you had, I was expecting you to be there with some robotics. You know, I, I was. I've been there in years you. previous. Okay, it, yes. but it was so packed. I don't know if you, you know, if you had been there at the same time I was there. Um, I know parents were talking about how they're having a hard time um, dragging their kids away uh, because <laughs> everyone was having such a good time. So there, we got some good pictures out of that too that you should look for because there are some really. Um, it was it was really fun to see the students teaching the, their parents and the parents actually there was one point where two parents were conferring with one another because they for the life of them couldn't <laughs> figure it out so um, it, was pretty, it was pretty fun um, I did get a chance to tour the White Bear Center for the Arts which I haven't um, I hadn't seen before and um, I just want to mention that because it is such a remarkable space um, and uh, it really great there's some really great opportunities coming up for our students to participate mm -hmm in a writing contest and then a, a visual arts contest as well. And just the commitment by the staff there to really um, advocate for arts in schools and then just really include our, our students and, and seeing arts as such a big part of our community. And it was a, it was a really fun place to be. And I just, you, and whenever it's open, you can just go and check out the gallery. So I'll put in a plug for that. Um, I also attended the um, Greater White Bear Lake Community Foundation um, award ceremony I don't know what if that's what it was called officially but in addition to um, uh, Julie Comfort uh, winning one of the or, or getting one of those grants for the binoculars also our um, our students from the um, modeling a protein story that that group of students that we've heard about a few different times they also um, earned a grant from um, the Greater White Bear Lake Community Foundation so um, I, so I was it was a really nice event and we're really thankful for the support of our um, community as well and I, I so I did a good job this time because I was trying I was tracking I noticed last time Luke and I had a lot of the same things but this time I was tracking with you so I was checking <laughs> things off so I didn't repeat <laughs> but I did want to um, highlight the the concerts the middle school concerts as well in the sixth grade concert it was standing the choir concert I was at it was standing room only I actually watched it from the hallway because there are just so many people out there um, coming out to see that choir and so um, really really remarkable um, concerts events um, just participation as well I mean that was an incredible sized choir I was really impressed with that so um, I think oh there was one other thing that I hadn't heard about until just recently and that was last time we were talking um, I had gotten to see the sneak preview of once on this island the uh, musical and um, I've, I've learned recently that they that the musical won or received several honors from spotlight education which is a program of the Hennepin Theater Trust and it honors high school musicals and students by formally recognizing the extraordinary achievements and process of developing young artists on stage and off stage. Um, so there were a number of awards um, won for, but from, for that musical. So, which I'm not surprised at all about. I don't know if you all got out yeah, to see it, but it was, show. yeah, it was very impressive. So, um, and I think, I think with that, that's my report. Anything else? Motion to adjourn, please. Second. Meetings adjourned.